Good morning. It's Wednesday, March 2nd. I'm Dr. Steve Stice, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, and this is a very special open mics. Today we begin something new. Today begins Show Me the Science. If you're a regular viewer, you know we always try to follow the science. We also recognize that years of medical school and debt and research make it easier for us to do that. We want to make it easier for you too. Starting today and the first Wednesday of every month, open mics will take a deep dive into research on medical topics, especially those that are making headlines. Today we're going to compare two drugs recently making the news as therapies to treat COVID-19. One has an FDA emergency use approval, an EUA, and the other has an FDA warning, as well as warnings and restrictions from other trusted health institutions. Our panel of experts include Dr. Mario Castro, Vice Chair for Clinical and Translational Research at KU Medical Center. He is also a brilliant pulmonologist and critical care physician like me. Hmm. <laughs> Infectious disease physician Dr. Nathan Barr is here in the studio as well. And joining us virtually is Dr. Matthew Shoemaker, one of our other outstanding infectious disease physicians. Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention Control, will join us shortly with a COVID count. But first, Jessica Lavelle has today's medical headlines making the news. The effectiveness of the COVID vaccine in children 5 to 11 falls off weeks after getting fully vaccinated. That's according to new data from the New York State Department of Health showing that the vaccine's effectiveness fell from 65 percent to just 12 percent in 28 to 34 days. Experts believe the lower dose being given to that age group is likely to blame. President Joe Biden marked the new CDC masking guidelines by going maskless during the State of the Union address at the Capitol. Last night, the president talked about living in this new world by also saying that researchers are close to having the vaccine ready for children under the age of five. He also talked about ordering one million of Pfizer's antiviral treatment pills. And now we're launching the test to treat initiative so people can get tested at a pharmacy and if they prove positive, receive the antiviral pills on the spot at no cost. He also said people can start ordering more of the free COVID at home test kits starting next week. The president said, quote, thanks to the progress we have made this past year, COVID-19 need no longer control our lives and most of us will soon live mask free. And speaking of removing masks, students at the K-State campus are no longer required to wear one indoors. K-State made the decision based on the CDC's newest guidance, which looks at COVID-19 case rates and hospital availability in each community to determine the need for masking. That will do it for today's headlines. Dr. Seitz, I'll send it to you, but first just curious your thoughts, the panel's thoughts on the masks simply coming off. Yeah, you know, it's a, it was a brave move. I think they're trying to make a point to America that things are just much safer than they have been, which is true. What we know is if you look at the CDC guidelines, they actually tell you to go county by county to determine if you're in what zone you're in, whether or not you can take the masks off. Mm -hmm. In this area, Jackson County and Wyandotte County are still in the red zone. Technically, don't take the masks off. But in Johnson County Yellow Zone, you can take your masks off. Now, the problem is that what America heard is you can take your masks off. And so I think that's probably what they're going to hear even more, guys, from the con from the congressional thing last night. Dr. Barr? Yep. Made me a little nervous, I'll be honest. I know you um, do. You were talking about being nervous <laughs> that he got here. Yeah. Yeah. That's just sort of my nature, I guess. But, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, it's I, I, to me, there's, you know, when I see so many cases still, I, you know, they're dropping. That's great. But, you know, we look at our hospital numbers. They're still pretty high. And um, it makes me a little uncomfortable to sort of be proclaiming yeah. you can take your masks off. We'll see how this goes, and we'll be prepared any either way it ends up. Just one quick point about that: the, di the data in the Pfizer vaccine in children. What it said is it's not it, the effectiveness against disease transmission or acquisition by a child drops off rapidly, but the protection against severe hospitalization and severe illness is maintained. So don't go away with this thing. Oh, the vaccines don't work for kids. That's actually not true. That's what the headlines have captured. The reality is that when you step back and you look at all the data, you get into the science of it, what it says is the vaccines are still effective at preventing severe hospitalization and injury. You know, that's why science is so important. You gotta yeah. dig down deep. So I'm excited about today's topic because 
you're going to, to go with us in a journey for how we think. But before we begin, you have to hear what some of our experts may say when they what they mean when they use terms that we look for when scrutinizing the research. Our goal is to empower you on what to look for when medical research or studies are bantered about. The first term is academic medicine. I'm going to ask every one of our panel to briefly explain what that means to them, why they chose academic medicine, and share their background in conducting clinical research. Dr. Castro, I'm going to start with you. This, this by the way, this guy's in charge of all the clinical trials here at KU, <laughs> so he does practice a lot of science. All right. Thanks, Dr. Steitz. Well, academic medicine is why I went into this field. It's the three pillars of academic medicine, which is excellent clinical care, high quality clinical care. It's education. We are here to train the workforce of the future for medical uh, care. And then thirdly, outstanding research. We're here to set the bar for, for research and to do that premier research uh, that our medical field needs to advance that. That's what makes me get up every day, get to work no matter what. And uh, despite being through this pandemic for the last two years, academic medicine is what attracts me. And in, in fact, isn't almost all medicine today that we practice from drugs and new therapies and treatments, all of that comes from the research that's done to help show us what the new therapies are? Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, the reason we're here is, is really to advance that field. Um, we're not here to do what's been doing, done the last 20, 30 years and say it's okay. No, we got to question that and we got to do it the right way with the right research. All right. Dr. Barr, Academic Medical Center, Academic Medicine, talk to us. Yeah, I mean, so my journey with academic medicine, I started off really just wanting, uh, I wanted to focus on patient care and, and I got to where I really liked global health and for me, um, my research career has really tied that in well. So I do work on, on diseases that unfortunately are really high mortality rates. They kill a lot of people. And um, I'm really driven to try to make dents in that. I'm really driven to try to improve that. And so when I think of academic medicine, those same missions that Dr. Castro talked about, I, th I think of how the research is going to make that difference in the future so that the patient in front of me with a question I didn't know how to answer, we can now answer that question and we can get that patient through that disease. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shoemaker, talk to us about your journey in academic medicine. Um, I am less heavily involved in research than Dr. Castro or Dr. Barr and more heavily involved in the academic side of it. Um, and that's what drew me to leave uh, hospital administration and private practice and come here was to be engaged in the teaching of the next generation of physicians so that we could help them better understand not only how to care for patients, but how to interpret these studies uh, and the designs and the things that we're going to talk about in the coming minutes. You know, I'll tell you, I think it is so important to think about that. You know, I'm not, I, I am nowhere near the research level these guys are, and and, uh, and, and I, uh, my hat's off because people like Dr. Castro, the folks who are advancing the science, and here's why that's important. I spend my day trying to create a good environment for people to be able to do that work in. That's my job mm -hmm. here at KU. And I think, and I treasure every moment of it. I treasure every moment. I love coming to work every day because I take care of patients with cystic fibrosis. And when I started, the average life expectancy was about 16 or 17 years old. That was back when then, man, 1990. Today, the average life expectancy is 45 and with trikafta, it's estimated people are going to live almost a normal life expectancy. Think about that for a moment. A deadly disease transformed, not just because they got more doctor's appointments or they had more rapid care, but because science changed the game and changed the story and the narrative from one of you're going to die really early to you better start saving for retirement <laughs> because you're going to be around to live like that. And I'll tell you, every time I've had that conversation with my patients, I get tears in my eyes. I'm like, you got to save for retirement now. You got to think differently than you thought your entire life. What a story that is to me. It is a miracle. And I think that's what science really helps us deliver. It helps us deliver miracles. But it doesn't happen because somebody just said it's true. It's said because we worked hard at it. We know that not all research is created equal. When we say clinical trial, our next term, what are we talking about? How does a clinical trial differ from, say, an observational study or a survey or maybe just uh, somebody saying, Dr. Castro, that they think that they got better on a certain pill? 
Well, a clinical trial is a research study by definition, and it's a research study where we're testing some medical therapy or surgical therapy or behavioral therapy uh, in our patient population. And we do it in a very systematic, controlled fashion uh, that we'll talk about later uh, in order to arrive at a answer that we as clinicians can trust. Yeah, I think that's so incredibly important because that clinical trials puts all the data out there so we can all look at it and figure out, wow, did that therapy really help or not? In order to have an effective clinical trial and one we can have a lot of confidence in, there are a couple of principles that are important. And one of those is being randomized and another is a placebo con control group. Dr. Barr, talk to us about those. Yeah, so, you know, randomization is really just like it sounds. It's, it's basically using a, a random approach to assign patients to get, you know, one treatment or the other. In this case, we're talking about a placebo control group. And what that means is um, we're, you know, in that sort of a study, you're giving a uh, patient either the medicine of interest or you're giving them a placebo, a, 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 traditionally a sugar pill, but something that is expected not to do anything to improve the disease you're talking about. And the reason that's done is because you have to be able to understand, is the medicine truly helping or, or is it is some other effect? We know that the placebo effect is real, right? This is, this is a function of essentially, you know, um, doing something seems to help uh, whatever condition you're talking about. So what, why we give a placebo is to try to hold against that and to make sure we can actually tell, is this... Um, is this medicine actually doing something or is it simply just the act of doing something is helping some symptom? So it's pretty cool because as I remember, you guys can talk about this, but the placebo pill looks just like the real pill. And yeah. so if you're the investigator, you can't tell the difference. The packaging's the same, everything's the same. The only people who know that are the study monitors back someplace wherever it is. Like you don't know that when you give it to patients, Dr. Castro, yeah. is that right? Yeah, no, this is so important. In, in my own field in asthma, um, just by changing the color of the pill, people feel different. Just by saying, oh, you know, giving a, uh, a nice advertisement or a video saying, oh, well, look how this thing potentially works, will change people and how they react and improve their lung function uh, just from a placebo. And so we have to do the right science, which is having a placebo controlled trial. Um, we did a study a few years back um, with the flu vaccine and we gave over 2,000 patients, half of them the placebo, salt water, uh, and the other half the flu vaccine. And what we found was 30% of the patients that got the placebo said, this gave me the flu, this gave me you know, the bad side effects from, that the flu shot gave me. And exactly 30% of those that got the flu vaccine said the same thing. So it allowed me to, at the end of the day to say to my patient, hey, this is safe for you. We know that some people have aches and pains after, you know, receiving a, a shot, but we know that this is no different than placebo. Having participated in some of those studies, actually an injection of saline in your shoulder turns out it does hurt. <laughs> <laughs> you may not believe that. So this is an incredibly important point because you're getting a pill. You don't know which one you got. You're randomized, so it's even distribution of all sorts of ages and races and, and diseases in both groups, and we can really draw a, a, a conclusion from that. So Dr. Shoemaker, talk to us then about trial participants. Let's talk about what is sample size and demographics. What does all that mean? So when we're enrolling patients into these studies, we want to make sure that we get uh, a large enough number uh, that the, the data is uh, meaningful. Uh, think about it like flipping a coin. If you flip a coin 10 times versus flipping a coin a thousand times, you know that you're more likely to get a 50-50 spread if you flip it a thousand times as opposed to 10 times. And that's the, the benefit of sample size. Uh, the other thing we want to do, especially in the studies that, that we're involved with in adults, is make sure you get a good sample uh, across the spectrum of age uh, so that all, all ages are uh, represented as well as uh, gender representation and representation of uh, other groups. 
Yeah, the, all of this is incredible because we study, and there are epidemiologists, spend, people who spend their entire lives constructing these trials to make sure they're done right, to make sure that the conclusion from them is true. And sometimes we lump multiple trials together to try and figure out if there's a real trend. And this, to borrow a term that almost sounds like it came out of Star Wars or Star Trek, is a meta-analysis, Dr. Castro. So explain to us about a meta-analysis. Well, this is a trekky type of term. It is uh, pretty cool. It's, <laughs> It's, uh, it's a biostatistical approach in how we basically lump studies together. Um, when we have, say, 20 studies that are studying how the flu vaccine works, we need to understand how each of those studies enrolled patients. You know, did they enroll elderly patients, as, as Dr. Schumacher mentioned, or did they enroll young patients? Did they enroll patients here in the United States or patients in Europe? And so all these are what we call demographics or different characteristics of the patient population. And the meta-analysis will take that into account. And the first thing the meta-analysis does is rate the uh, quality of that clinical trial. That's the very first thing because if you have a poorly done study, you don't want to include that in the meta-analysis as we'll talk about shortly. Um, and so that quality evidence is critical to how we do a meta-analysis. And that requires some judgment, which at the end of the day is one reason I don't like meta-analysis because <laughs> I may not agree with that person's judgment or not. Um, and I like the old fashioned randomized control trial, but it does give us the power of numbers because you're able to combine studies together and now you're able to talk about those thousands as opposed to just a few hundred. It feels like the randomized, large randomized placebo controlled trials help tell us truth. Meta-analysis can kind of give us trends that we yep. needed to study a little bit more. All right, so we just had Dr. Hawkinson walk in, so we're gonna to talk to him in just a moment, but if you have questions about other terms you hear today or just general COVID questions, send those to us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. The links are on your screen. Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention Control and an ID specialist is in the house. He joins us with our COVID count, which is a little more hopeful today, Doc Hawk. Yeah, and I never meta-analysis I didn't like, so a uh, little bit of no. academic oh, humor there for you. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, our cases are going down now. We had seen kind of a, a plateau there in the, in the 40s. Now, uh, 38 active infections with five in the ICU and one on the ventilator. Still 72 in that recovery period, so a total of 110, but overall, our trend continues to be uh, improving as far as decreased um, hospitalizations. All right, well, thank you, Doc Hawk. Yeah. And just to say, you clearly need to work on your beard growth because the rest of us all have one. I'm doing Shave to Save to support the American <laughs> yeah. Cancer Society, but uh, I think uh, you may have to join us here pretty soon, brother. Yeah, it takes me a long time. So. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, for our debut Show Me the Science program, you may have already guessed that we are going to, uh, wait a minute, I'm supposed to ask, do we have any reporter questions on the, uh, for today? All right, I'm gonna go back to the debut because this program is aimed at education. It's we are teachers today. So you may have already guessed that we're gonna compare and contrast the research around two drugs that have been in the news a lot lately for the treatment or prevention of COVID. And as we teach to this question, what we wanna do is talk to you and teach you about the science. We will walk you through why the Food and Drug Administration gave one drug emergency use authorization and why there are numerous warnings and or restrictions given the other drug. We're talking about Paxlovid and Ivermectin. We're gonna start with Ivermectin. Dr. Hawkinson, you're always talking about the timeline yeah. for research around Ivermectin. Walked us through it again, and we're gonna put up some graphics so folks can follow the timeline. Yeah, and so everybody remember, Ivermectin is, is a drug that's been around. It is very good for what it was approved for, and that is for parasitic infections. I know me and my colleagues have used it for those, uh, those parasitic infections that we see in the hospital as well. But we are kind of bringing you up to date now of Ivermectin within the context of prophylaxis or treatment for COVID-19, because obviously when the pandemic started, we were all looking for some way to help us out of this. And certainly treatment is one way as well as prevention. Um, so to start out, you know, in February 2021, the National Institutes of Health declared that there was insufficient evidence for their COVID-19 treatment guidelines panel to recommend either for or against ivermectin to treat COVID. Uh, the NIH treatment guidelines panel is a think tank of doctors 
and scientists who pour through COVID research, who are all trained to critically review that research. Uh, then with also um, with uh, research and doing those and uh, from across the globe with doctors like me that prescribe those drugs, um, they were able to give recommendations or they are giving recommendations uh, for interventions for their patients. After that, um, about a month later in March 2021, the World Health Organization recommended against using ivermectin for treatment of both hospitalized and ambulatory, which is outpatient uh, uh, treatment. So ambulatory, outpatient uh, is the same thing uh, for COVID-19 outside the context of a clinical trial. And we've just heard a little bit about clinical trials. Moving forward now to June 2021, news was spreading around the globe um, fairly quickly that a certain meta-analysis, and we've heard about a meta-analysis, and that's a collection of several studies that they are looking at. Um, the, this meta-analysis of 15 clinical trials claimed ivermectin reduced the risk of death among COVID-19 patients. However, by July, uh, the analysis was quickly, quickly retracted because um, it was discovered that one of the biggest studies among the 15 trials was based on fake or falsified data. Moving ahead a couple months now to September 20, uh, 2021, the Infectious Disease Society of America, which is uh, mine and my infectious disease colleagues main uh, governing or, or looked to body for guidance, um, joined with the World Health Organization and recommending against ivermectin for both hospitalized and ambulatory COVID patients, again, outside of a clinical trial. Moving uh, to a month later, October 2021, uh, researchers uh, who had been digging deep into that raw data of the meta-analysis discovered flaws, including uh, that one-third of the people in the largest trial were already dead when the trial recruitment began. When the researchers removed that fraudulent data, the benefits of ivermectin disappeared as the quality of the trial data increased. Uh, or sorry, decrease. This past December is when the FDA came out and said it would not approve off-label use of ivermectin to prevent or treat COVID-19 in humans or even animals, citing it was not effective and could do uh, and also could do harm, which obviously one of the tenets of medicine is do no harm. This brings up uh, this brings us up to date with the most recent study released now in February 2022. JAMA Internal Medicine published the results of a randomized clinical trial that showed ivermectin does not reduce the risk of developing severe disease or progression to, of disease compared with the standard of care alone. And the things I like about this trial is sampling size and methodology. The study was conducted at 20 public hospitals and a quarantine center in Malaysia. And I also like that it was randomized and we know the importance of that as well. Uh, thanks for walking yeah. us through that. Well done. Good research truly takes time and require critical reviews. It's a good learning moment for our class and research today. I want to talk to some of our colleagues about this for just a moment. We always want to see the most recent data, and so should you. But Dr. Castro, falsifying well, data. What would happen to you if we <laughs> caught you falsifying data? Well, I'd probably lose my job. Yes, uh, you would. <laughs> I, yeah. But I mean, a third of patients were dead when they were recruited in? That's uh, just egregious. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's really somebody that has a you know, an alternative motive uh, for falsifying data. And, you know, at the end of the day, when we submit a paper, it is peer reviewed. And that peer review helps us weed out some of this uh, falsified data, but it's not perfect. I, we've seen studies retracted even after they're, they're published. I, as a clinician, have, like to see multiple studies. And that's one of the reasons is I, I you know, Maybe one of these studies is, is wrong, and so I'd like to see multiple studies done by individuals across the world, potentially, or across, at least across various demographics, and I want to see consistent results. When I see, you know, 10 studies and they're all going in different directions, and, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, I said, we're going to wait on that action. Yeah, I mean, I think it's actually scary to me that, that people uh, would put an agenda around those trials and recruit patients who are dead. I mean, that, 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 that's, that's stunning. And um, I, I think we, we just have to have a stronger moral compass than that. Even though ivermectin is not yet proven effect, effective against COVID, the research does continue. Dr. Castro, tell us about a trial for people who are interested in ivermectin as a treatment for COVID. What is that trial? Who is a candidate to participate? How do they sign up? Well, great. Well, 
as the science teaches us, we need to do the right study and do it the right way. So this is a randomized controlled trial that is placebo controlled, just like we talked about at the very beginning of the open mics. And this is called the active six study. We are studying um, ivermectin, fluvoxamine, and we just completed the arm looking at fluticasone. So we're studying various treatments and each one of these have a matching placebo arm in them. Um, the study is being enrolled across the country. Uh, we have a site in our KU health system at uh, KU Wichita, led by Dr. Tiffany Schwarzenegger Schmidt. Uh, the QR code is there to email them if you're interested in participating in the study. It's an exciting study because we're really going to put the science behind ivermectin. Is it, is it effective or not compared to placebo? The first part of the study has already enrolled over 3,000 participants. Um, what we've done in this trial at, um, at the advice of an expert panel was let's really nail this down. We increased the dose of ivermectin, so we doubled the dose, and we increased the length of treatment. So that at the end of the day, we will solidly know whether or not ivermectin is effective at the lower dose or at the higher dose for the treatment of COVID infection. Again, this is um, a study looking at participants that have outpatient ambulatory COVID infection, not sick enough to get into the hospital. Uh, you do have to be 30 years of age or older. So we're uh, looking primarily at adults. You do have to have uh, a positive PCR test for COVID-19 and you have to have uh, within 10 days and you have to have symptoms within seven days uh, of infection. Very important across all the studies that we've looked at for treatment effect of COVID is you don't want to wait several weeks to, to go get a treatment. You want to do this very early on in the treatment, and that's the most likely point that you're going to find effect from the medication itself. So this is the real science. This is the real science, and you can enroll in an ivermectin study sponsored by our school of medicine if you if you just get that qr code on your phone you it'll take you right to the email and the address is the call it's pretty cool pretty easy so dr barr malaysia yeah so is that data transferable to the united states well there's differences right i mean i think you don't want to say outright oh, oh well this happened in a different country we can't translate it that's i think that's that's a little too um, straightforward way to look at it. There are going to be differences in the population. You need to look hard at, um, you know, things about, you know, their age, their sex, uh, all these different things. What sort of conditions are they living? What treatments were available? All that sort of stuff. That's what is the more important thing. Um, you know, it, as I said, I, you know, I do research um, largely focused around global health, a lot of it in Uganda. And, you know, so it's, it's certainly a different country in the U.S. But if you're looking at the same diseases we're looking at, same population, very transferable. But you have to know that information. You have to be able to dive in, look at the information to understand is it truly a similar population or is it actually very different. Dr. Shoemaker, you have spent your life, you've devoted your career to the treatment of the infectious diseases and in patients of all types and all, all ages and with all sorts of diseases. Do you feel like there is enough evidence right now to use ivermectin just that anybody should be able to walk in and receive a prescription? Uh, no, I mean, right now the data is, is pretty clear that this is not an effective treatment for COVID-19. Um, and although generally it's a benign drug, you know, at higher doses, uh, it can cause vomiting and diarrhea and that in the setting of uh, COVID-19 can make your disease worse and end up in hospitalization especially if you're getting your ivermectin uh, from online or veterinary sources where you don't really know what the doses are. Yeah, so I think there are some, some concerns be fraught with danger around it. We encourage people, if you want to help us study ivermectin, please enroll in this study. And how long have we had that study going on now? Uh, for the last four months now. So we've been at this mm -hmm. ivermectin study for a while. So it's not just something we put together. It's a national trial mm -hmm. looking at an important question around ivermectin. Now let's look at, Dr. 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 please, Dr. Go, go. I just want to mention on the one thing I forgot to mention on the, on the Active 6 study, it is done virtually. Uh, so you can enroll, even though it's based here at, at KU Wichita, you can enroll from anywhere. Um, yeah. And it can be done uh, just with consent. Uh, we will do that over, over the line. And so I, I just want to encourage people to think about participating in that because 
we want to know for sure. It, it, we think it's not effective, but we got to do the right science to prove uh, whether or not that is or not. Which is an amazing statement. That means anyone in Missouri, Kansas, they can all enroll or other mm -hmm. places can enroll. Just zap that QR code, you can get there. All right, let's look at Pfizer's Paxlova drug. I want to contrast this a little bit. This past December, just three months ago, the FDA authorized Pfizer's Paxlova tablets for emergency use in the treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 in adults and pediatric patients 12 years of age and up, as long as they weighed at least 88 pounds. It was not approved for the prevention of COVID that's being studied. So very specific guidelines have been issued around this. Then in late February of 2022, just a few days ago, the NIH COVID-19 treatment panel updated their guidelines to include prescribing Paxlovid for patients at high risk of severe illness or hospitalization. Let's talk about the quality of research that underpinned that recommendation. The Paxlovid trial was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. Pause. <laughs> what does that mean? That means that when you were a study participant, just like you would with the ivermectin study, that you could have either gotten a placebo, a sugar pill, or you could have gotten the Paxlovid, and you wouldn't have been able to tell the difference by looking at those pills. So that's randomized. You didn't have a choice. You didn't get to pick which one you wanted. You get randomized into the study. And then it's done in a looking forward fashion. So we're, that is, we're giving you the medicine, and then we follow and see how you do. And because it's randomized, both the placebo group, those with a sugar pill, and the study group, those who got the real pill, had the same types of characteristics. And we're gonna look at that when we look at the demographics of the trial participants and the methodologies. Here's what we know. No. 2,085 total uh, patients were studied who are 18 years or older. They were unvaccinated, because the question around this was in an unvaccinated patient population, with the laboratory confirmed case of COVID. They were also at high risk for disease progression or in other words, at high risk for severe illness requiring hospitalization or a high risk of death. 1,379 participants received Paxlovid in the form of three pills twice a day for five days. The placebo group received three pills twice a day for five days. You couldn't tell the difference between the pills. So hospitalization and death were the key measurements. That is, those are what we call endpoints. Those are the things that we look at and say, did the drug really meet what we thought it was going to meet? Did it reduce hospitalization? Did it reduce death? So Paxlovid is the brand name. Each dose actually involves two antivirals called nermetrovir. I can't say that, help me out. <laughs> Bar? Nermetrovir. Nermetrovir, okay, whatever that is. And Ritonavir. Ritonavir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. See, mm -hmm. ID doctors specialize <laughs> in naming things in the most bizarre fashion that no one can pronounce. <laughs> it makes it less likely that you would ask for it, I think. We feel important that way. There you <laughs> go. Nermatrovir, whatever, inhibits or interrupts the SARS-CoV-2 virus from replicating. This is important. The part of the SARS-CoV-2 that it goes after is a part of the virus that has been maintained through all the variants. So the thought is it should work for all variants and likely all future variants. Ritonavir slows the metabolism of the real active agents. And ritonavir has been around for a very long time as part of HIV meds. Mm -hmm. what, so what does our panel think about this research? We want to look at a couple of quick graphs. Guys, do you have those graphs we can pull up for just a second? All right, this is just a demonstration of how the trial, and you can actually go access this, public available data, and it tells you how they randomize people in between the two groups. And that's something that we look at whenever we see the research. We look at the research design, we ask ourselves, did it really work? Let's go to the next one. Okay, this is the demographic slide. And what you wanna focus on is, are the groups equal between the same? And okay, again, this is the same thing we look at all the time in research teams. Mm -hmm. We look and say, did the people who got the drug look the same as the people who didn't get the drug? So there's no, what we call selection bias. That is that we were biased and so then the results become biased because really all the men were in one group and all the women were in the other group or all the folks who are African-American are in one group and all the white people are in another group. And that unfortunately, historically, that's happened in research. So now we look very carefully to make sure that the groups are equally, equally distributed. Then go to the next slide. All right, here's the real truth. Paxlovid looks amazing. If you see the number of patients in the blue line down below, it's a reflection of how many people progressed to severe hospitalization and death on the placebo arm. Now look at the red line down below. Hardly anybody 
had that. And this is a high risk group in the red line. And again, this is the type of data we pour through. And then we pour through who did it work for the best? Or were there groups that it didn't work for? And were there groups that had terrible side effects? Because we didn't show this part, but in this article you can go look and you can find what are the side effects of these, of these drugs? Are the side effects worse than the treatment? Those are the kind of questions we have to answer to answer the question, is it effective? It is safe? Let me turn to our panel. Team, what do we think about that research? Dr. Hawk. I think it's, it's sound research. I think they've uh, identified caveats, looked at all of those things, just as you talked about. Um, again, we know that uh, because of the publication, the peer review process, uh, but overall, I think the research is sound, and I think their conclusions are really supported by that raw data. And Dr. Barr, this is a type of research I think we want to see. Yeah, the, I mean, this is ideal, right? It's, it's a large trial. You're going to be able to, to detect the effect well. Um, they've designed it that way so that they're going to enroll enough, enough participants where we can really look at it and, and be confident that, you know, it wasn't simply, you know, if it didn't work, that there simply wasn't enough people enrolled. Um, it's, it's a randomized trial, so we know there was, you know, we, we know they randomized it, and then we can look at the data looking at the various um, underlying health conditions and say, yeah, they did a good job randomizing that. We can be clear that there is not a problem with the randomization, and that gives us confidence in the results. The blinding is important, too. So you go down the list one by one by one. Mm -hmm. They designed this trial really well, and that's why when we saw this data, we're really encouraged by it, and we start thinking immediately, how can we get this to our patients? Let's make sure we can get this as soon as we can. So Dr. Castro, people falsifying data makes my heart hurt, but this type mm -hmm. of research has to make your heart sing. <laughs> yeah, no, this is the type of research that I, I, I strongly support. I, I think this is um, gonna be exciting data. I think President Biden even referred to this I in think the he did. state of the art, um, um, uh, state of the art, or state, state of, of the, the nation. <laughs> yeah, state of the union <laughs> uh, address last night. and. You know, the idea is how fast can we get this potentially to our patients because, so we mentioned earlier that timing is so critical. The faster we can get this to our patients early in their uh, onset of symptoms, then the more likely it's going to avoid those uh, effects of progression leading to uh, hospitalization or death. And so uh, I was excited about potentially this being available um, for free in oh, the that's pharmacy. A big deal. And so, so just to say we're not financially benefiting from it because no, it's exactly. going to be free to everybody. That's, okay, there you go. That's what we need, and we need access to this. And, and so this is, to me, the, the home run, right? If we can uh, make this treatment available to all my patients, whether or not you have the means or not, uh, and you can get it started early in the course of the disease, then we can get ahead of this. And just to say, there some people will say, well, gosh, you guys prescribe these drugs because you get paid more money when you do, or you get paid more money. The reality is that physicians, if you get paid more money for doing something like that, you go to jail. So <laughs> that, that there's this whole, man, there's a red line around that uh, that is uh, enforced very, very actively by uh, CMS and others. Dr. Shoemaker, when you see things like this, would this make you comfortable? Are you comfortable prescribing Paxlovid for patients? Uh, yeah, I'd be very comfortable uh, prescribing this. When you look at the adverse effects uh, in this study, they were similar between the patients that received Paxlovid and those that did not. Uh, the, the bit of caution, though, is that uh, ritonavir is in there, and, and the test-to-treat strategy that President Biden had mentioned gives me pause because ritonavir, although generally safe, has a lot of drug interactions, and so that's something that uh, you really have to be cautious for because of the way it can change drug levels, either up or down, depending on what you're taking. Let's let's hone in that point for just a moment because one of the things that really works well in medicine, I think, is the relationship between the prescribing physician and the pharmacist. Pharmacists are trained to look for interactions like that, Dr. Shoemaker. Talk to us about the important role of the pharmacist in saying, I know you want this, but really the ritonavir part of this may make it unsafe for you. Yeah, I mean, the pharmacists are going to be key to this, ensuring that they have an accurate uh, current medication list for the patients uh, so that we don't do them more harm than good by giving them this medication. Yeah, I think that's a critical, important point, mm -hmm. Dr. Castro. What about pregnant patients? Would that, was that something we could give in this, this, did that work for this group? Yep. Dr. Barr? Yeah, it is. 
Yep. All right, so good in pregnancy, and we know pregnancy patients are at a high risk. So I'm going to turn back to you, Dr. Castro, this relationship. When you do these clinical trials, I'm going to bet pharmacists are involved with you to help you make sure that the drugs have developed, delivered safely and effectively. Yeah, our, our pharmacists are our right hand. Uh, they are there to help us in conducting these clinical trials. They're the ones that are unblinded, so they put the pill in the, the placebo pill in, or they put the right pill in, you know, the active treatment. And they're not involved in interacting with the patients, but they're allowing us then to conduct these trials the right way in a blinded fashion by not us not knowing what the patient got. But I, I you know, at the end of the day, they're the ones also in the community. And so there are partners in the community that can talk to our patients in the community and, you know, go over their medications carefully and make sure that this is ultimately safe uh, for them. So they're, again, our partner in caring for our patients. And I think this is such an important point, and this is why we go to medical school or we go to pharmacy school or we go to nursing school so that we can learn about how do we judge the research, how do we decide what's really safe, and when we do, how do we make sure that we don't have side effects that can hurt patients, and how do we do it as a team? Medicine is a team sport. It's not up to one of us to try and be the hero all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Medicine is a team sport. We all have to block and tackle, and if we don't do that to together, that's when patients struggle. That's when outcomes aren't as good. So when you try and take one of us out of that team, suddenly the team loses its credibility. It's kind of watching like watching Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl against Tampa Bay Buccaneers that offensive line. doesn't go as well. Okay, Jess, we've been talking a long time and hopefully it has been of interest to our inaugural class and hopefully we've been good teachers. Do you have any you, questions from the community? You have. I do. But before we get to questions, Dr. Stites, I, it dawned on me, and I want to clear something up. You know, when we do our headlines off the top of the show, it's meant to be helpful. It's not yes, meant to create more confusion. Yes. Um, and based on some comments this morning, I think that some c confusion um, came up. And so I'm hoping you can clear this up about the data for vaccines for kids 5 to 11. Uh, okay. Help people better understand what that meant so that they can walk away today right, with let's, the right let's do information. Because I, I thought that was a little funny. So, Hawk, let's go. Let's take it on. Yeah, you know, I think some of that data, um, and please correct me and I'll defer to my other colleagues here, but having gone through that research, I think the message from the media is really way off. I, I think that data emphasizes and continues to support what we already know. Uh, if you look at that article and you look at their conclusions and you look at the caveats with that data, a lot of it centers around that third dose of vaccine. And they show that in those adolescents that were able to get a third dose, the effectiveness of that vaccine and that immune response was raised to what it was prior. Um, again, we are getting further out from that second dose, but those younger children did not get that third dose. And you know what we're learning more and more from basic science research and now from clinical research is that it's really that, that, that three exposures to spike. And again, I'll defer to my colleagues, and, but what we mean by that three exposures, it's either three doses of vaccine uh, or it's an infection and two doses of vaccine or two doses of vaccine and infection those three exposures really are what will create this optimal immune response for T cells and B cells. The other issue here is now we also know that there has been a, um, a change in some of the guidance allowing for a further time between that first and second dose for certain age groups. Why is that? Well, on, on the first go around with all this information, we really wanted to get these vaccines into arms. And so we were using the smallest amount of time available. But when you actually extend that period of time from that first and second dose, uh, in that time, you are also developing an immune response as well. So I think the importance here is it continues to support um, the effectiveness or the efficaciousness of these vaccines of that third booster dose for protection, really not against infection, although that is a benefit early on, but it's really against that severe disease and having to go to the uh, emergency room, the urgent care, and especially the hospital. In those younger age groups, we know did not get that third vaccine dose, but those older age groups uh, of children were able to, and we saw a, a, um, a rise to the previous levels of effectiveness. Dr. Barr, um, I think this part, point about hospitalization and death is still really important too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's the thing that I, I think I would drive home about this is, I mean, if I if I made the headline, it'd be like, you know, vaccinations still great at preventing hospitalization and death. Yeah, that's I, all. 
That's it. Yeah. That's really that's the bottom line. He lost this. Well, you may still get infected. Okay, yeah. Well, Omicron. We all know that's the case with yeah. the vaccinations. The question is, do you stay out of the hospital? Do you stay, keep from mm-hmm. dying? The answer is overwhelmingly yes. Yeah. And uh, especially if you had all three doses of your vaccine. Okay, Jess, did that help clear it up? Hope it did. I think it did. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Barr, just some good news for you. A lot of people on this feed saying that they're still going to be wearing their mask indoors. So hopefully all right, that, that you makes go. you feel good. <laughs> um, Isaac has a question. How do you feel about the test to treat program that President Biden just announced, where you go to a pharmacy to get tested and get sent home with vi- antiviral pills? If you test positive, does, does this bypass the safeguard system of doctors prescribing medication? What do you think, Dr. Castro? Well, it's a great point. And I, I think we, we did have a little word of caution there in regards to the test of treat and test to treat. And I, I do think, though, um, having worked with a lot of these patients, uh, there's often this delay, you know, and it's delayed just getting into your doctor or into the health system. So. I feel comfortable if you're testing in the environment, you have that test result, you have a health profession, whether that be a pharmacist or advanced provider in the clinic um, that is associated with that pharmacy and can review your medications, your your medical history, and then prescribe the medication based on those uh, test results and knowing your history, I feel comfortable with that part. Yeah, and Dr. Shoemaker, how about you? Yeah, I mean, to, to echo what Dr. Castro said, as long as they have uh, either a pharmacist or a nurse practitioner or physician assistant there that can uh, review the medication list and make sure there are no severe drug interactions, I, I think it's a, it's a way to get those patients engaged in care and treated sooner. Uh, because as, as Dr. Castro said, a lot of times, unfortunately, we're seeing them at the hospital when they're outside of the window where treatment would benefit them. So here's where this is really important, right? Because this is a pill that has to be given within five days of symptoms. So that's really quick. If you think, you know, if anybody's had COVID or, or even just, you know, wanted to get tested, things like that, right? Well, you spend, you know, the first day or two kind of hemming and hawing yourself. <laughs> I don't know. I just have, you know, I don't know if I really need to get tested. And by the time you actually do it, you might be running close to those five days. So that's a really good thing. But what I would encourage everybody to do is if if you're, you know, thinking you may have COVID, you want to to go along this route, go to the pharmacy or go to the center where you get your medical care, where you get your prescriptions filled, because that's going to be a lot quicker and a lot easier for that that system to actually um, check your medications and make sure it's safe rather than if you go to somewhere where you've never been before and they have to you know try to track down where where your medicines are what you're on all that sort of thing that's going to make it happen a lot quicker for you so that's something that you know you as the patient can do to really try to move it along and make sure you're getting that really effective med quick as you can Huck. Yeah, I'd like to drive home that point by Dr. Barr as well. Mm-hmm. Um, what he talked about was within five days of symptoms. You know, that is the essence of all of these things. Early treatment in these viral stages, which is very early in disease, the first seven to 10 days, the early treatment with these approved drugs is vitally important, whether that's molnupiravir or Paxlovid or the monoclonal antibodies. That is extremely important if you are developing symptoms, contact your healthcare or go try to get a test and get diagnosed so that you can get that early treatment with these drugs. Here's what else I would say. There are all sorts of treatment guidelines in medicine. This is no different than other treatment guidelines in medicine. Mm -hmm. We do this in other diseases. And the reason is this, you put the team together, in this case, researchers, physicians, pharmacists, nurses, they write the treatment guidelines together and then uh, then the team can affect those guidelines. If you have any question, the first thing your pharmacist is going to say to you is, you should contact your fi- your primary care doctor and see if they think this treatment's indicated. It doesn't mean it's a complete free for all. This is not a free for all. This is people coming together, writing treatment guidelines, saying this is best practice. We think this is really safe. Look at this incredible clinical trial that is as clean as it can be. That clearly demonstrates overwhelming evidence of the importance of the and the impact of Paxlovid. And they say we're going to give it to you if you test positive because we want to eliminate this delay and we're going to do it because we've all come together to write the treatment guidelines as a team and part of those guidelines are going to be if there's any question contact your physician jess i'd like to get to just a few more questions if i can do you think the publication of studies that have not undergone peer review yet has enhanced or diminished medical science regarding people's perception of it 
Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Dr. Castro, yeah. <laughs> it so made me nervous from the very beginning of this yeah. that we could start throwing data out there before it got peer reviewed because there's so many retractions. But take a swing. Yeah, no, I, I think this is an important point. As I mentioned earlier, peer review means that you have other experts review that science, review that article, and make sure that it's uh, we provide feedback. Sometimes, I haven't gone through the system many times, it, it changes uh, how you present things. And so... Um, I think it's ultimately very important. You know, the preprint uh, being available online is the purpose there is to speed the information transfer. But the problem is the information may not be correct. Um, and so there's actually some open journals now that are going to a refereed preprint mm -hmm. um, uh, status so that at least you have a quick touch in whether or not that is um, a valuable thing to put online before you actually do that. And I, I think that's the, probably the way to go, that we need some kind of check to make sure that things that are in error are not put online for the public consumption. Here's what we know. Preprint articles are not pre-truth. They're not yeah. pre-false. They're just premature because we're putting it out there. And when I say it's premature, I mean it's pre the article being truly mature in that people haven't had a chance to review it. We may sometimes have to pull the data back or critique the data. We do it at times of great national crisis. And that, again, that's not new. It's just new because everybody sees it online now. But um, this is not a new concept. It's been around for years. The challenge to us is this. Don't believe on a preprint edition or preprint article. Don't believe that it's true just because it got posted. There's a difference between that, right? Pre-mature. Uh, it, it, it means you've been posted, but it doesn't mean you've been fully reviewed. Jess. Melissa wants to know, can someone who wants to be part of the ivermectin clinical trial also receive other treatments at the same time, like monoclonal antibody treatments? And if not, if someone does qualify for monoclonal antibody treatments, would the doctors recommend they not join the ivermectin trial? That's a great question. Dr. Castro. Yeah, so all, all these studies, when we enroll participants, if you're on another treatment for, for COVID-19, you will not be eligible uh, for that trial. Because otherwise, we would be confused by the results. Um, and so uh, that is correct. Um, and so if you have that choice, uh, I would say review that with your physician because they're the ones going to know that what is your risk in terms of uh, progressing on to severe infection should you go in for um, treatment with Paxlovid or should you go on treatment with a monoclonal antibody as opposed to participating in the study? Uh, I do think the studies are very safe though because what the studies offer to you is that they monitor you very closely at home. Uh, they provide you the tools to do that. And so it does give you better access, I think, to somebody that will, a health professional that will be monitoring you throughout the study. So I'm very comfortable with that in the appropriate patient that is not at high risk of developing severe disease. So this ivermectin trial has been open since, if I go back, it's four months, it's like November or something like that. So we've been at this for a, quite a while, and that means a trial, you had to work at it even before that to get us in, to get us to be a trial site. So talk to us a little bit, the timeline, there's a lot of timeline built into these kind of things. Yeah, so, uh, well, everything has been speeded up, that's for sure, uh, in, in order to address the pandemic. But uh, there is a process in, in how we even develop a study. Uh, it does undergo peer review, um, and it does undergo uh, multiple experts weighing in how to do the study right. Um, but, I, you know, we're, we're pretty good at this by now. We're two years into this uh, with, with the pandemic, and, and this trial was set up in this adaptive trial design so we can bring in new treatments we can answer questions quickly, and we can move on to other promising agents and include those in the trials. Jess? To know how many participants does a study need for results to be valid? Do they need just enough, or is bigger better? Oh, that's the question. The power of a yeah. research study, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Barr. It's, I mean, it's different for every, every single trial. So it depends on what you're trying to look at. So, um, you know, for some diseases, it you know, if you think there's going to be a very large obvious effect, you may not actually need to enroll a huge amount of people to find that out. And of course, we want the study to be done as quickly as it can be, because if we do find a good effect, we want that treatment available to everybody. We don't want to just keep studying against a placebo forever if it mm -hmm. in fact has an effect. But we don't want to under-enroll it, because then we may miss an important effect. So there's a very complicated process that uh, thankfully we have 
um, you know, biostaticians with PhDs, et cetera, that uh, really are experts at this sort of thing, and they can help us calculate what is the pro proper sample size for this particular question, for this particular medication, for this particular outcome that we're looking at. So there's a lot that goes into that question, and it isn't as simple as um, bigger is always better. It's very detailed. It's and actually a great question. And fortunately, there's even a thing called, uh, Dr. Castro, the Data Safety Monitoring Board that watches that information come in, and if they see a trend either good or bad early on, they're gonna let folks know. They can actually call a study. Yeah, so the, the right way for a study to be done, again, the science, is that you have the safety monitoring board, and they're experts. Uh, they're experts in the material, they're biostatisticians uh, that know how to analyze this data, and they provide us guidance in whether or not this treatment looks like it's working, well, we need to keep this trial going. This treatment is not working at all, it's what we call futile. Uh, we need to stop enrolling patients in this trial. So our trials have that, the Active 6 trial, which I mentioned, does have a data safety monitoring board, and it helps us uh, it, uh, in really ensuring ongoing safety during a trial. Um, in the active studies, our general framework is we study a drug first a few hundred patients, we review the data, and then we decide can we open it up to a larger study where now we're enrolling a few thousand patients. Um, ultimately, as we talked about earlier with the Paxlovid study, you need a few thousand patients for something like this in terms of ambulatory or inpatient treatment with COVID. Jess, one more question. Last question? Okay. Isaac is saying, I assume that trial participants are not fitted with tracking devices. So that means data gathering is relying on self-reporting. Have you ever had trouble getting data because participants are just reluctant or too busy to report? Dr. Castro. Yeah, so actually we do provide uh, um, instruments that uh, participants in our trials uh, monitor at home. Uh, so uh, in our Active 2 trial, we utilized a oxygen sensor. So you, you got an oximeter at home, tracked your heart rate, um, and you were recording symptoms. This was monitored 24-7 um, by a healthcare professional um, across the country. So. This allowed us to keep in touch uh, with our participants in the trial. And as I mentioned, I, at the end of the day, I think this is a powerful part of a clinical trial. You know, that's part of planning too, right? So when we talk about, we always, when we're running studies, we worry about that yep. exact question. We don't want to have patients enrolled and then not be able to find out what happened to them. So that's part of planning the trial. You develop a strategy for how are we gonna keep track of these folks, make sure we can get in touch with them, make sure we know what's going on and they make their study visits. So it's actually something that we work hard in a clinical trial to make sure that we have low numbers of patients that we can't find out what happened. Well, I wanna say thanks to this amazing group of people. And, and you know, we said a minute ago, it takes a team. Gosh darn it, it takes a team. One of the things we have to be careful about is that N of one where I'm out there doing things on my own and trying to tell everybody how great it is. The challenge to that is what you saw with, and I made that reference to Patrick Mahomes in the, in the Super Bowl against Tampa Bay when the offensive line was struggling. The reality is Mahomes can't do it by himself. The truth is it takes a team. Medicine is a team sport. Science is a team sport. You're only as good as your weakest link. And that's what we have to cope with and try and work on every day. It has been a great discussion. I'm really looking forward to more of these Show Me the Science episodes on open mics. I want to get final thoughts from our guests. I'm going to start with Dr. Castro. Well, if we could put up the QR code one last time. I, you know, I, I do want to mention the science is there because we have participants. And, and participants are people that volunteer to participate in these studies. And I always say to my participants, I say, you know, you're not only doing this for yourself, but you may be doing, the, more importantly, you're doing this for others uh, that are in the same situation. So consider your participation. Here we have the active uh, six study uh, QR code and um, help us get ahead of the science, uh, of this pandemic. Dr. Shoemaker. Um, Paxlovid is very encouraging, but we need to remember that the most effective way to prevent hospitalization and death is getting three shots of the vaccine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Dr. Barr. Yeah, well, I, I just, um, you know, I would say thanks for uh, this idea of really trying to present, um, you know, information to sort of help people understand uh, all this nitty gritty stuff that goes into clinical trials and research. There's 
as you can tell, a ton there. Um, we spend our lives training to be able to conduct these trials well, um, to make sure that the evidence we get from them is reliable. And I think the more information folks have, the better they're going to be able to dive into a study and, and find out, is this actually something that I can rely on or not? So I would just encourage people to make use of this. And uh, and then, I, I don't know, I, I think I'm also going to say, maybe don't throw away your mask, huh? <laughs> <laughs> don't throw away the mask. Duck Hawk. I think we're all into prevention. So obviously mask wearing in those high risk situations is, is still a viable option. And if you don't feel safe, please do that. And certainly agreeing with Dr. Shoemaker, you know, vaccination is the safest way to prevent hospitalization. Um, moving on now to treatment, I, you know, Steve, I think we are now having and developing this standard of care for outpatient treatment. And again, earlier is better. We have the NIH guidelines. I think they would really uh, be cemented as current standard of care. And I think moving forward, just as you talked about, we have standards of care and medicine for treatment of a lot of different um, diseases. And I think once you go away from that standard of care, you really do open yourself up to uh, investigation and litigation. So I think it's very important to understand that. We do take our guidance from those bodies, from those not necessarily governing bodies, but certainly those think tanks and those bodies of physicians, scientists, pharmacologists, pharmacists, all of those who then develop these and critically review all this data to find what is beneficial, what is harmful. Um, and so I think we are getting there now with these NIH uh, guidelines. You know, this is such an amazing time to be in medicine. Um, I told a story earlier today about being a a doctor with cystic fibrosis patients and my patients you know they die really young and and there are a lot of tears around that I've been to a lot of funerals of my patients um, and then I remember what happened when they went on trikafta I remember the patient coming back to me and saying you know Dr. Stites I can go out to dinner with friends and not be embarrassed I can go to a movie and not have everybody look at me I can I, I can be on a date and not have to worry about how I came across it's a miracle. It is a miracle. Because what they said is, Dr. Steitz, I don't have to cough. That's the miracle. The miracle comes about because of a team. And today, what we really taught you was about teamwork. And ultimately, that's what science is. That's how we can beat the pandemic, when we work together. Let's fly. Jess, talk to us about our guest tomorrow. Dr. Steitz, thank you. Um, the, the, the images are, are, are sickening and heartbreaking. And here inside the hospital and around the community, people are just worried about the war happening in Ukraine. And the question is, how do we talk to our kids about those images that they're seeing? So how to cope with this latest crisis on top of a pandemic, a crisis that is impacting our pocketbooks and our peace of mind. Child psychologist, Dr. Stephen Lassen, will help us navigate how to talk to kids, while adult psychologist, Dr. Greg Nawalnik, will offer insightful tips for us grown-ups. Plus, we'll look at how one local organization is responding and how you can help too. We'll see you tomorrow at 8. Everyone have a great day. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites Podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.